My name is Karina Harney, Playboy's Playmate of the Year, 1992. And I'm Echo Johnson, Miss January, 1993. Welcome to the Bunny Chronicles. Let's go. <laughs> Hello. Welcome back to the show. We are back in the studio today with an extraordinary guest. And we have Miss Kathy St. George joining us again as our guest co-host. Thank yes, you for being you. here, Kathy. Thank you. They Wonder- can't get rid of me. Um, tell the audience again um, who you are. I was Miss August 1982, and I also I did a cover in October 1981. Right. So, so yeah, we've got I have our, many years. We've got our rotating uh, guest um, uh, playmate sisters uh, coming in as co-host, and it just adds a little addition to the show. Not to mention Kathy and Candace go back a long way. So, oh, Candy or Candace, yeah. I love that you're wearing your bunny head. Good, good, good. Oh, of course. Look at her cup. Look at her cup. So let me, um, I'm going to, oh, that's cool. Look at that. Isn't that fun? Oh, how fun. <laughs> You're so lucky. I love it. <laughs> so let's begin with introducing um, Candace for our audience. Um, so Candace's, um, her lifelong association with Playboy began in 1974 when she became a bunny at the St. Louis Playboy Clubs, which is very interesting. And she was 73, so. Oh, really? It said 1974 in her. Okay. 1973. (laughs) Uh, She would know. Yeah, she would (laughs) win. Um, And then following her inclusion in a Best Bunnies pictorial in the magazine, she was invited to transfer to Chicago, which was the um, founding city of Playboy. Um, that's where Hef was was born, and that's where the original um, offices existed, and uh, Playboy Club, and, and the Playboy Mansion. And we are dying to hear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't get to be a part of that. We're going to go oh. into that. So, um, let's see. In 2017, Candace was invited to reprise her 1979 cover with six other prominent playmates. Kathy St. George was one of them yeah. that was featured in yes. that editorial as well. And then um, in 2019, she was contacted again by Playboy to appear in a 12-page cover story feature in the magazine's new iconic Winter 2020 Equality issue. So lots of lots of history with Playboy. On top of it, um, Candace is a renowned and very um, well-known and acclaimed media personality. Um, and she's the founder of CandidCandice.com and associate publisher and editor of the Chicago Star Media. She's got a long list of uh, credits and accolades. So I read her column this uh, recently, too, and it was really fun. Nice. I learned about all the good restaurants to go to, and <laughs> which is the way to my stomach, you know, <laughs> and my heart. So, um, yeah, so with that, Candice, introduce yourself to the audience, and yeah. we're going to just kind of start with the beginning, Playboy, and and, and how you even, uh, first of all, became a bunny in the clubs, and then uh, we'll go from yeah. there, okay? Well, thank you. You gave me a great intro, Echo, so I, I hope that I, uh, I'm i not going to do myself any shame by saying it myself. But No, um, go ahead. I guess I started with Playboy um, in 1973, as you mentioned, and um, I was valedictorian in my high school class. I come from a very small town in Southern Illinois. It's Dupo, Illinois, and it's a little railroad town. And I, I was a typical uh, overachiever. I did everything in high school that you could possibly imagine. And I was so fried by the time I graduated and I did get a scholarship to St. Louis University. I only went there for six months because the thought of four more years of school just made me my hair stand on terrifying. No, me not too. Really terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. So coincidentally, at the same time, a girlfriend of mine said, Candace, they're hiring at the St. Louis Playboy Club. You should go over and try, you know, try out. And so I was underage, so I couldn't serve alcohol. Okay. But I went over and I tried out, I got it. And so they put me on the door, you know, greeting people or the bumper pool table or the gift shop. And actually, the door is what I did in Chicago, too, because I absolutely loved it. You, you're the first one that meets the people. That's you know, right. Yeah. And I'm so social. It was just the perfect position for me. So um, and yes, after I did a Best Buddies pictorial in St. Louis, I was contacted from Chicago to ask me if I was interested in moving into the 
Playboy Mansion. That didn't take a long time to say. I was yes. say yeah, let me. Yeah. <laughs> How long did you think about that and make that decision? Yeah. Ding, about ding, ding. Zero <laughs> seconds. So, I mean, and I had never been to Chicago before. So, you know, I mean, here, and I'm from a small town. I don't know where I got the guts to do that, but apparently, you know, it was something that was in, inside me that I You were always a go getter. I do. Right. So I got in the car, I drove, you know, 55. It was like entering the Emerald City when I got to Chicago. And when I pulled up to the Playboy Mansion, there was a butler there that opened the door and said, welcome home, Miss Collins. And I'm oh. telling you, I just, it was the most, it was so emotional. And I felt like, you know what, I am home. And I never once had any homesickness. I never, ever re obviously regretted that decision. But I mean, they really did truly, even though it was Hefner's home, they made you, all the girls that lived there feel like it was their home too. It was really special. Absolutely. And 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 equally um, the same for the mansion that we knew, um, yeah, exactly. West Coast. But I want to, I want to talk about the, the Playboy uh, or the Chicago mansion, because I don't know anything about the it. Pool, Not a lot. I remember there was a pool in the, gr in the ground. Right? Or so, something. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us what oh, it was they had, like. Uh, they had, well, it was in the main dining room, which was so spectacular because it was all wood, dark cherry wood. I mean, the floors, the ceilings, the walls, and it was like a you know massive stone fireplace. And he had impeccable taste in antiques, and so sure. the place was beautifully appointed, as you both know from you know the L.A. mansion too. And so over in the far corner of this massive dining grand dining room was a, a fireman's pole. And the fireman's pole, they had a little cover around it at the bottom, and you remove it, and you slide down the pole, and you hit these pillows at the bottom, oh. and then you walk a few steps, and there's the underground pool. Wow. And now the underground pool, it was a small pool, but it was it was fabulous. And he had, you know, swimsuits in every size available. Always. But um, when you go into the pool, there was a big window on the side, and all the guests could go down into the lower bar and see the girls or, the, or boys Swimming. or whoever here swimming. So, I mean, it, he was really way ahead of his time. I mean, I had never seen or heard anything like that before. And uh, I, it was really a trip. And he had an underground bowling alley. And cool. uh, I mean, it, you know, we were all we had access to the rooftops and they had, you know, sun ch chairs up there. I remember we used to throw water balloons off the, the roof to, to passerbys. On the <laughs> so, it was a lot I've of done great that memories. Too. <laughs> Kathy's done that once or twice. I could see her doing. I think there were condoms, yeah. though. <laughs> I think I blew, filled them with water. So, so the caliber then of the um, of the um, Chicago mansion, you would say equal comparison to the yeah, West Coast mansion. Yeah, okay. exactly. I mean, obviously, the one in LA was bigger, but I mean, this I one think was, it was elegant I, too. A little I more think elegant. this had a lot of had a lot of charm, and you know, I mean, his touches were everywhere, and. You know, he had the plaque on the door that if you don't swing, don't ring. And, yeah. you know, when, the, when all the artifacts from the mansion sold in that auction, that was one of the highest price items that was sold. So, I mean, it was I really truly that. iconic. Yeah. Uh, then a piece of memorabilia. And so you actually lived there for a bit? Yeah. Yeah. I lived there for two years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I worked at the, uh, at the club in Chicago. I was Playboy Bunny of the Year in Chicago and first runner up in the international contest. And so I was, you know, I knew all the art directors. Actually, that's how I became a centerfold because the art directors and photographers all came for lunch at the club where I was. And since I was the first one they saw, they'd say, oh, Candace, we have a photo shoot. You want to come upstairs and, you know, test for a cover or, you know, can you do the key club, club sales? They had life-size posters of me in all the clubs um, for key club sales. So I did a lot of work in the photo department through, you know, my was Tom Stabler and the people as they came into the club. Was Tom Stabler the... Oh, yeah. No, he yeah. shot almost all my covers. Yeah. I mean, he was, yeah, so, absolutely so famous. And I mean, they were, they're all like family. I mean, it was, you know, it was, I never thought twice about taking my clothes off for the camera. I mean, it was just a job. And, and, and all the photographers treated it as such. I mean, they never looked at you like you felt like, you know, you were doing something. No, bad it, it was well. always professional across the board and there was nothing right. uncomfortable well, about it. We were actually talking right. about this yesterday and, and, or, or actually, no, I did an interview with a, um, with a podcast I'm going to be on out of, um, out of, uh, London. And she was asking me what it was like on set. And then if you were, you know, fearful or were there a lot of people in there, why not? And I was like, it was the most, consummate professional environment that you can imagine and we were all made to to feel very 
very, very comfortable. Um, yeah. Before we move forward, I want you to uh, tell us who Tom Stabler was for our audience so they know because he was a very Tom important Stabler, figure. Again, he was a senior art director for Playboy Enterprises. And uh, he was kind of, uh, him and Gary Cole were like Hefner's left-hand, right-hand people. And Gary know, for, Cole was yeah. the uh, uh, chief editor uh, in Chicago? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Senior editor. Senior Chicago. editor. And uh, fabulous guys. I'm, I still keep in touch with them. I mean, I know you girls. I mean, we I all, love it, Gary. they stay forever in our lives because it was such they special do. family. So, yeah. so, uh, so I didn't know that they would have a Playboy Bunny of the Year, and that's different for the audience listening. There's yeah. there's a difference between the bunnies and the playmates. The bunnies worked in the clubs, and the playmates were the centerfolds. There was always Playmate of the Year as a centerfold, but I didn't know that there was a Playboy Bunny of the Year. And so you were awarded that honor. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, and they flew all of us. They, had, they chose one. The key holders voted, and so there was a winner from every club. And all the girls were flown to L.A., a big party at the mansion. And then it was televised live on ABC. And it uh, was uh, we went and wow. broadcast it uh, from the uh, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. We had like a week of rehearsals. Um, I mean, there was like O.J. Simpson was one of the judges. Cool. Um, oh, my God. Let's see who else. Um, uh, Milton Berle was one of oh, the wow. judges. Oh, <laughs> wow. How cool. And, uh, yeah. I wish I could remember others because they were all, you know, like. Really high quality, except for OJ. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> we it was no back then. I'm sure Bill no, Cosby was know. around too, and he's on the naughty list. <laughs> so, so how soon after then did you be um, uh, become a, a playmate and shoot your centerfold after being a yeah. bunny? How many years were your bunny before you did the centerfold? Um, let's see. So I was a bunny, and I, I came to Chicago in '74. I was bunny of the year in '76, and I shot my centerfold. I was December '79 playmate. Nice. Very yeah. cool. And you did a, and you know, I a just ton of realized, covers. I just realized that my centerfold is Raquel Welch on the cover. Oh, that's a great issue. How cool. I, know. I love it. And somebody reminded me of that. And I said, Oh my God, you're absolutely right. And they said that this was the largest issue Playboy ever did. It's 421 pages. That's page. right. Wow. And uh, so I didn't realize that she was the cover girl on my issue. So do you have some of your covers there? Because yeah, she did a bunch of covers. Yeah, I've, okay. yeah. Look at there. She. That's a great one. Awesome. And I love this cover because Hefner signed it. Oh, see. So I have to so say, beautiful. I had never seen that cover, and that is stunning. With because you have the most beautiful, bright, bright blue eyes, and what a cool cover to do that with just your eyes. You. And well, we you know, actually there's, did there's a cover, a cool the behind, same cover. Yeah, there's a cool story behind this eyes cover because. Uh, Tom Stabler loved this idea. And he, so he's the one that shot this this cover. He had, had so much trouble convention, convincing Hef. Hefner that this was a go. Because yeah. before this, they, it was always women's body parts on it. There sure. was always some kind of sexual, you know, uh, uh, boobs or something that was showing it. So he took, it was really not easy to convince him. But once this got published, it won the best cover of the year for the Marketing Best Sellers Association. I believe that. And Tom Stabler gave me the plaque that I have in my desk. Nice. And and I believe that yeah. because, um, and we keep talking about this throughout our shows, that at the end of the day, the publication half approved every finite detail from the front cover to the back cover, right down to the font placement. I mean, everything and there certainly were images and um and photos etc that he didn't like I, I went through the same experience i had shot a cover it was uh it was four of us on the cover and was absolutely gorgeous Hef did not like it kimberly hefner loved it and pushed for it and and at the very least was like Hef, at least like reshoot it so we reshot it he ended up running the second one which did not even compare to the first one kimberly ended up giving me the original one and i was like that's when it should have been but yeah it was it was very um Hef was very you know concise and and um and Visual, visual his, his on visual exactly idea what he wanted it to look like, and I knew that there was a backstory on that. So thank you for sharing that because that is a yeah. rare cover yeah, with somebody's thanks. eyes. It's yeah. one of my favorite. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm really. I was so excited about that. And you know who else uh, tested for that was Patty McGuire. Oh, ah, uh, so they really? turned me over Patty. So. I actually did a cover, and Vicky McCarty did the same one, and the only reason Tom shot it he goes you only get so much money for covers so we'll shoot a few so that you can get paid more but i already know vicky's gonna do it 
<laughs> so l- let me ask you a question because this is something I just found out recently from Rick Palak, actually, or not Rick Palak. Um, it was uh, Stephen Watts who wrote Mr. Playboy, and and uh, he's actually going to be one of our interviews coming up. And what a, what a awesome human being! But um, he shared with me that um, that Hef's brother um, was the one that actually went in and taught all the bunnies or trained all the bunnies in the clubs in terms of the bunny dip and the appearance and whatnot. Was Keith still at that point? Did you have interaction with him with training or? Yeah, no, I did hear that he did do that. But when I was a bunny, he did not do that. Okay. So, now, can yeah. I ask when you did the, the the bunny of the year or whatever it was, did you have like the swimsuit thing, the whatever, did you have to do the bunny dip to no, show. no, no. Okay. It was, it, was, uh, it was really cute. You had, well, you had like an evening gown and then you had your costume. Oh, cool. And then they had, all, you know, each judge would ask you questions, you know, kind of a little mini Miss America kind of a pageant. But I Peace will tell you, you, of yeah, course. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want. Curing cancer. Yeah. But, um, uh, the, but I will tell you that the trophies that they gave out are spectacular. I mean, do you still have big, it? I still have both of them. Yeah, oh. I have the one from Chicago and the one from the international pageant. So oh, that is so cool. And it and it should be noted, um, you know, because this is often a question that comes up, and again, people assume that if you're a bunny, you are a playmate. Yeah, but that- um, th- there weren't too many uh, bunnies that went on to be centerfolds. There was a small group of them, so that really is a an honor. You know, Thank that's you. true. I'm very yeah. Well, I'm very proud of it. I love being a bunny. I'm, you know, I'm an only child and they were like all the sisters I always wanted. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and people say, oh, it must have been a lot of cat fighting and competition. I never, ever experienced any of that with those girls. And, and I experienced that more after I left Playboy than I ever did with Playboy. Modeling to me outside of Playboy was much more vindictive and weird stuff and competitive. Absolutely. Than with Playboy. Absolutely. Yes, I totally agree. No comparison. So you worked extensively with Playboy for a period of, I mean, I would say, de- well, decades, obviously, because, you know, then you decades, shot, yeah. you know, in the in the 2000s to reshoot your original. Yeah. I was there that night because I got to see it on Christmas. Oh, the one, the oh. last one you did, remember, we were yes. at that. Yes. And that's when it came out. It was well, beautiful. You know, they, uh, Playboy had a CBD. They were doing a uh, pleasure for all, um, you know, marketing plans. And they approached me to shoot. Um, you know, you shoot yourself with some of the products and whatever. And so I shot it and I put it on my Instagram and everything else. And they said, you know, you're an ambassador for life. And I thought, I'm going to put that on my profile. Good <laughs> idea. Exactly. For life. I'm very, very proud of it. So it was, yes. it was, I'm glad they still think of me. As as we all are so very proud of, of being they a, invite a part of everything. I mean, they invite, she's always invited to everything. Because they love her. Yeah. Cooper oh. loves her. At, yeah, no, I mean, standout. Definitely. I mean, I, I sit there and go, I know her, so I'm going to just snag it on the back. Oh, of her t- that's <laughs> not true. But thank you, Kathy. No, you, you both are. Uh, it's, a, it's a very dynamic group of women that are involved. And it was a, you hit the jackpot when they, Playboy said yes to you, I think. Absolutely. And I think that so any true. girl, and this is why it bothers me so much with that handful of malcontents that have been, you know, trying to be so disruptive about Hefner's, you know, reputation. It just makes my hair stand on end and I get so angry. Uh, and all these girls were rejected by him in one way or another. So it's sure. all, you know, a revenge book that they wrote or a revenge uh, video that they're trying to put out. And mm-hmm. I just I just don't have any tolerance for this. No, I mean, no, none of us do. And and at the end of the day, um, and, and, and we keep um, saying this, uh, that first of all, Karina and I are so grateful that we have this platform. Secondly, every guest that comes on and every interview that we've had, it's consistent in what we all say about who Hugh Hefner was as a man, as a human being, an icon, running the empire, et cetera. And I'm sorry, but if Hefner was this sexual predator, as these people love to claim, specifically speaking to Dark Secrets of Playboy and Alexander Dean, who was the executive producer behind that salacious, gross docuseries. Yeah. Um, 
it just was not the case. And and these women are trying to rewrite the narrative of Hugh Hefner. And thank God that collectively all of us, and it's not just me and Karina from the 90s, we're, we're talking decades of everybody can back it up that no, Hugh Hefner was not like that. And at the end of the day, if Hugh Hefner was a sexual predator like these women are claiming, this would have come out decades and decades and decades ago. You do not run an empire like that successfully without a hiccup. And so he dies and then this comes out. I mean, it's it's so easy to see through it and see what they're doing. But of course, mainstream media and, and younger generations are going to latch onto it and believe everything that they, yeah. you know, see and hear. But it's just not the case. Most no, people want to hear the bad fame. stuff. They want to hear the bad stuff out there. But the yeah, fact and these is, girls want 15 more minutes of fame at his expense. So, and yeah. all you have to do is right. say no. Uh, Echo, it is so <laughs> transparent. Yeah. 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 It really is. Because if you said no, he didn't love you any less. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> So, um, so, so moving into, you know, uh, your career and, and then what that looked like up until what you're doing today, definitely Playboy was a byproduct of that. You learned so much from it. And, and here you are today, you know, with, with uh, so many accolades, um, your philanthropic, your philanthropic endeavors are vast and many, and you understand the importance of that. Hugh Hefner, obviously, as we know, was all about philanthropy. So so talk about what that journey was like and, and you yeah. creating what you're doing today. Yeah. Well, you know, um, coincidentally, when I was thinking about leaving Playboy after I'd done all, you know, every I'd actually done everything I could possibly do, you know, the bunny thing and the centerfold and the covers. And so um, it was the art directors that suggested I get back into modeling, which I thought was pretty interesting. That's how much, you know, they were such good guys and they wanted to do the best for the girls that they ran into. And so they did my composite. I mean, they shot it. They, you know, graphic designed it and everything else. And so I started modeling in Chicago, left Playboy, and I was uh, really successful at it. I traveled to Europe and modeled. I was in risky business with Tom Cruise. I had a cool. billboard in Times Square. Um, and it was just a fascinating journey. And I, uh, I, I, I've been modeling actually since I was 13, but I had, you know, really not done anything except Playboy when I was focused on that. But, um, so I did that for the longest time. And, um, uh, and then I met my husband, quite mm -hmm. frankly, it was in 1989 and, uh, we got married six months after we met. And Aww. he's a real and, catch. And you're too. still Aww. married today. <laughs> yeah. 33 years. I have he's to give you a pause on that. That's amazing. I'm, That's wonderful. So I am so lucky. But um, so anyway, so we honeymooned and we, you know, enjoyed each other for a couple of years or whatever. And then um, I, there was a platform that the Chicago Tribune started to put out a blogging platform. And I had been writing about, you know, things, what to do around town with my blog. And um, they contacted me and they said, we want you to be on the platform. And so uh, they wanted to use my blog, which I said, no, I said, but I will write for the platform. So I started writing about social events around town, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it, there's a lot of coincidences in my life because when I started writing that, the Tribune wanted to find a social columnist. And the only one that was doing that work was me. And mm -hmm. so they called me in for an interview and I got the job. And so I was a columnist for the Chicago Tribune for nine years. Wow. I mean, I've written articles for a Huffington Post, for the Orlando Sentinel, I mean, well, Charlotte Observer. And uh, so I, I've been really lucky in that sphere. And um, and so one thing led to another. And uh, then I started uh, with Chicago Star. Um, I created the brand um, that is now quite popular in Chicago. We started with a print paper and now it's on a digital platform. I prefer print, but that's another story. Yeah. Um, but my blog is 15 years old this month, this year. So Amazing. I've had it for 15 years, candidcandice.com. And uh, like you said, Echo, I said, you know, what I cover mostly in the blog is nonprofit events. Because that's kind of where my heart is. I'm a member, a member of the Paws Chicago, which is a rescue for animals. Um, you know, the Joffrey Ballet. I mean, a lot, a lot of charity work that I'm proud and privileged to be able to do. And I, you know, share their event news and I promote whatever good news they have to share. And, you know, and people like that, I, especially, you know, during the pandemic when all the news was bad. You know, it was my website, thankfully, that people turned to for because I never wrote anything negative. I don't ever do gossip. No. I don't ever share bad news. And, you know, so 
you know, people needed a little sunshine in their lives. And I like to think that I was it. So, well, I love that. And, 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 and that speaks to like current day because all you see in mainstream media and news is negative, negative, negative. On top of it, it's lies. It's twisted. There's no truth. There's no objectivity there. <laughs> and, and and people love to just to put out the bad, the negative. And it's like our world is really a dark place right now. It and and it is unfortunate. And TV. you recognizing that and writing about positivity and, and being involved, being in service, philanthropic endeavors, that's awesome. And I applaud you for that. And there should be oh. many more people in the journalism world that do that. And and it's almost like it's a lost art. Like it doesn't exist anymore. And I don't like it. It bothers me. I know. Well, you know, it's shocking to me that more people haven't picked up on this positivity thing. I mean, because, <laughs> you know, you can't keep doing the same things when the world's falling apart. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I've also seen her do red carpet where you've interviewed people on the red carpet at certain events that you're at, too. Yeah, I've been privileged. I've uh, interviewed Al Pacino. I interviewed Retha Franklin. I was the only reporter allowed in her dressing room when she was in Chicago. Uh, Colin Farrell, you know, Reese Witherspoon. I mean, you name And Jennifer some of those Peter. cutie patooties on fire, all those uh, Chicago Fire and oh, stuff. Oh, Chicago Fire, Taylor <laughs> Kenny. Oh, you're absolutely right. I've been very lucky. But no, I have a YouTube channel, Candid Candace TV. Mm -hmm. I've got over 200 videos there with some of the top celebrities and, you know, some really funny comments that they made because, you know, it's like you're in an enclosed space and they feel like they're you're just talking to them one on one. So they say things that are, you know, a little unexpected. There's a lot of fun. Which is stuff. more fun. Yeah. And she does fashion uh, instance, shows Colin too. Farrell, when I talked to Colin Farrell, he said, uh, I said, well, you know, is there anything that you've always wanted to do, you know, other than being an actor? And he says, yeah, he says, I've always wanted to be a journalist. And uh -huh. I said, well, it's really not all it's cracked up to be. And he said, neither is acting. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I thought that was a really candid, honest comment that he made. But uh, yeah, he was adorable. So I've been really lucky. And she does, but she does fashion shows too. I see her in fashion shows all the time. I believe it. You're stunning. I mean, I she's love it. tall and yeah. has these gorgeous. Oh, appetites. well, jack of all trades. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I like it. She's got more energy than God. <laughs> I'm telling you. I've never seen but anybody. You know, like Kathy, it. I told you before, my mother, you know, uh, and my father, at any party, they were the last two people to ever leave. You would have to get a hook to get them out of the party. <laughs> so it's all in it's my in DNA. your DNA. I, I'm exactly the same. Yep. So. Absolutely. Good news, bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, in what year did uh did Hef um move or or sell the Chicago mansion and move to Los Angeles? Was that 1971, 72? Was it no, because he was still living here when I moved into the mansion okay. in 74. Okay. And it seems to me like he was here for another year and a half, maybe a year and three quarters after that. So uh, maybe coming back and forth, but I know that he was still here for quite a while after I moved in in 74. Did you spend much time? He could have bought the mansion before that, for sure. Sure. I, I think he was um, bi-coastal at the time, yeah. you know? So, yeah. so I'm sure you also spent a lot of time at the mansion and uh, in Holmby Hills as well, right? Of course you did. Of course you did. And, and, and equally as amazing... Yeah, it, and I love that all the bunnies get together sometimes and have oh, the little yeah. get together. Yeah, you well, know? you know Diana Peterson of a bunny, she plans these big, massive events. I mean, the last one they held was in Chicago. I think the next one's going to be in Orlando, and they have like a. Of like a thousand bunnies from all around the world that come together. I have I mean, so we, many really, friends we, that are bunnies. We need to go to that. Go. Karina and I need to go to one of those. And yeah, you and should interview cover it. as many bunnies as we possibly can. That I didn't know that yeah. was continuing. That would be amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's fabulous. And at the one in Chicago, Christy Hefner gave the most incredible speech about how important the bunnies were to her dad and what they meant and what Playboy meant to him. I mean, she had everybody in tears. It was just so heartwarming. Oh. And uh, so, yeah, Diana Peterson does a great job of bringing everybody together, all the bunnies. Yeah, I okay. stay in touch Good with to her. Um, I think she has a Facebook thing. And I yeah, stay in touch definitely. With her. Yeah. Did you so how how when is, did you do a lot of promotions and um, events with Playboy after you became you did right so you were oh, traveling yeah, constantly lots. oh I traveled constantly I was in Canada all across the United States and uh, you know who I used to do a lot of promotions with because we had similar personalities was Gail Stanton 
And she was one of my best friends as a playmate. I mean, that little Southern accent. And you is know, she, she a dated playmate? Elvis. Huh? Was she a playmate? Yes. Oh, yeah. Playmate. Yeah. Do you know what, so cute. Do you know what year she was? Just, uh, you know, I don't. I could probably look it up, but I can't remember. Off Gail the top Stanton. Of we, okay. We traveled everywhere together and we had the best time. She had the best sense of humor. And she died of a uh, like a punctured colon from a botched surgery. It was a real freak accident I, and horrifying. Oh, really? And I thought it was, yeah, diverticula. I heard something. Yeah. So we like, lost her at a way too young age. Yes. But anyway, she was she was one of my best friends. You know, and of the friend I said, I I ran into a friend of hers on the street the other day, and she brought up Gail, too, and your she name. Was, she was incredible. She told me that Elvis was a terrific kisser. Oh, Ooh, yeah. Cool. You know, sexy. I know he would be for some reason. Yeah. Oh, he was so sexy. <laughs> 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 Who doesn't love Elvis? Nobody. Well, <laughs> you know, you know. so speaking to that, and this obviously um, comes up a lot with, with the Playmates, or, or actually just everybody that we interview, that the longevity of the friendships that we um, not only uh, can— um, created, but have have maintained over decades. And there's not another company that I could think of in the world, a Fortune 500 company as big as Playboy, that would maintain those types of relationships. And that speaks volumes to the company and to yeah, Hugh Hefner, does. you know? And the environment that he created, you know, for everybody to work in. I mean, they're uh, they didn't pit anybody against each other like a lot of these businesses and jobs and employers that I know personally now. Um, uh, so, I mean, it was just, it was such a special, it was almost magical. I hate to use yes. that word, but it really truly was. We were like a sorority. But when I look back at it, it, yeah, a sorority. You're absolutely right. That's the word. Yeah. And I find it mostly in the 70s and 80s, um, towards the 90s, but as it got further, it was a little bit different. But the 70s, the 80s, and yeah. the 90s, everyone sure. was, and the night we were so close, you know. Yeah. Very so. cohesive group of girls. Yep. Yeah, that way, that way, that we all still maintain these amazing friendships, and how fortunate are we? Because we were blessed to be a part of this moment in time and this incredible legacy. Right. And you know, there's, uh, and I, I was would say, her makeup artist. That's how I met her. Oh, is that right? I was her makeup artist when she was 18. Yeah, when I was doing my small camera for my centerfold. Uh, so you, so you two have known each other a long time too then, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just celebrated my 30th anniversary in January, so yeah, it'd be 30 years that I've that I've known oh, Kathy. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I got to meet a lot of the girls even after I did Playboy, I got to meet them as models and I could also advise them and help them work and make them feel more comfortable because I'd done it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's yeah. a very uh, very cool vantage point to come from. Kathy was sharing that with me last night, and I was like, "Oh, I never thought about that." But for you to have had that experience and be working with Playboy and to be able to help, you know, these new girls that are coming in, whether they were testing or actually shooting, and not to be afraid, and you yeah, know. yeah, and kind of what to expect. Right. Ah, so fortunate. Yeah. Uh. Do you have any um do you have any specific memories or moments or you know whether it's funny or whatever with half that stand out that you can share with us? Well, there was a moment um I can't remember what year it was, but um Allison Reynolds had put together a group of 70s playmates. It was uh Patty McGuire Connors, it was Deborah Jensen, and it was um Monique St. Pierre and yeah. myself for just a really intimate luncheon at the mansion with Hefner. And this is when he was up in years and whatever. And I, I know she was trying to plan a lot of activities to, you know, obviously to make him happy. So we sat in the little ante room for lunch and we laughed so hard for, I don't know how long we were there, but we laughed so hard, all of us together. I mean, and I had never really seen his personality come out like that before in all the years I've known him, but he was laughing like a little boy. <laughs> and I will never forget that moment with those girls who are, were all special to me to begin with. But then to have, you know, have him be, I mean, it was just a lighthearted, fabulous memory. And I will always cherish that, that one moment in time that we had together there. Yeah, that's an interesting, and I loved Hef's laugh. He had the best laugh. <laughs> we were, we yeah, were yeah, looking, best. we were looking at old pictures that I'd pulled out of us and every single one I'm in with him, we're laughing our asses off. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, we just were laughing all the time. 
So, he had, well, you know, he he had a great sense of humor, and you know, he wrote that joke book, and he chose all the jokes for mm-hmm. Playboy. I mean, That's he right. had a marvelous sense of humor. Absolutely, he sure did. Absolutely, he he was just on uh, just so many levels. I mean, we always like to say this. I mean, obviously, yes, he was a genius, but Karina always says he was right brain and left brain, and I and I truly believe that. You know, mm-hmm. and and yeah. he was so, he was so, his hands were so on every aspect of the publication specifically. And when you sit down and you go through a magazine and you really take the time and you realize what it took to create that. Oh, he was so hands on. And, you know, I think people would be so shocked to find out just how hands on he was. Sure. I mean, I was a friend or I am a friend with a former art director, Jeff Cohen, who worked in Chicago. Of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. Jeff. You know, do you know Jeff? Yeah. Yes, I yes. absolutely adore him. Talk about a sense of humor. Anyway, we, we've been lifelong friends, but he... He kept all these memos that Hefner wrote to him cool. on various. I am telling you, they were the most hysterical things I've ever read. <laughs> One of them says, because uh, uh, Jeff was trying to do something and Hefner didn't like what he was doing. And so he says, Jeff, step step out of the batter's box. <laughs> <laughs> out of the batter's box. And then another time he berated Jeff because uh, he was looking through something that they had uh, done a mock up of. And he says, you know that one of the girls that you used in this special editions is a prostitute, don't you? And Jeff's like, wow, no, I don't know. And he says, get her out of there. <laughs> not the image. We're the girls next door. And he- so he- I don't know how he even knew that, but I mean, he was on top of everything. Yeah, everything. absolutely. That's and we funny. were the girls next door, especially back when I was doing makeup in the very beginning. I started in 80, but they were the girls next door. So many of them had never modeled or anything, you know, yeah. they, they were, yeah. that there was well, a Janet certain Pilgrim, power. Janet Pilgrim, the one of the first playmates was his secretary. I know. And she, she got to be in it in twice. <laughs> she yeah. got to be in it twice too. Yeah. That there, yeah. there absolutely was a, um, a caliber and a look that was associated with each of us um, playmates and centerfolds. And and there could be some really beautiful women that would come in and test and they wouldn't make it for whatever reason. And Hef just knew exactly what he was looking for. And either you were that or you were not. The man could yep. spot a pole dancer a mile away. <laughs> He could. He really could. I mean, I was shocked when Jeff said that he knew right away this girl was a prostitute. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh, shit. Get her out. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So we like to um, we like to always ask our guest um, two questions. And um, it's so interesting to hear the answers because they're all different and they're all unique. So three words to you that would define Hef. Oh, kind, generous, and charming. Ah, yeah. Love that. Love that. Did you get to uh, see Huff before he passed or spend any time with him? You know, when was the last I, time you saw him? Let me try to think about that. Um, you know, that that dinner, that lunch might have been the last time I saw him before he passed away. Okay. I went to the funeral, which was, I mean, I don't know if you were at his, his funeral service. I went to the we one had in Chicago. dinner the night before and you, yeah. gave, you gave me a little plug in the funeral thing. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, so I attended the one in Chicago and I attended the one in LA. And um, I mean, it was really, I have, I have, a, that, I have that whole service on my YouTube channel too, by the way. Oh, cool. And, and the comments that the people made, I mean, were, it, he was much loved. He was just much. Loved. Oh, he was adorable. Wonderful service. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So then, second question is: Had you had the opportunity to say anything to Hef before he passed or in memoriam? What would you say? Oh goodness gracious! You changed my life. I would definitely say you changed my life. He did. He put me on a pattern for success. Um, probably without even realizing it, just by giving me the opportunity to be involved with Playboy. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and you know what? He did know that. And there were conversations. Um, it wasn't one that I had had with him, but I've heard from, from other, um, women that he understood that this was a unique opportunity and this was your platform. And it was up to you 
to do with it what you may. Mm-hmm. And and some and some women were content with, you know, that they were centerfold, that was it. And they went on and carried on in their life in whatever manner. Um, I know personally myself, you know, I took full advantage of it and everything I'm doing today is a direct reflection because of Playboy. So he understood that, that this is an, a massive opportunity and now is your time to do with it what you may because yeah. there's so much out there that you can do after it. Right. Well, you know what? Another thing that I really loved about him is the way he protected all the girls. Oh, yes. So, and this is why that we spoke about earlier with these women with this nonsense. I mean, he was so protective. And the clubs, he had so many so uh, any security guys. If one of these men or anybody in the club even touched the girl's tail, I mean, they Ow. were thrown out and their cards were revoked. Yep. Um, you know, and one time somebody said uh, something about former playmate. He says, no, 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 no. There are no former playmates. Once a playmate, always a playmate, which was the title of the um, equality issue. The title of that feature was once a playmate, always a playmate. So he was he was he was really he was a godsend to me. Yeah, yeah I said absolutely. I said the same thing when you'd hear all, all these people, these guys that would be able to pick us up. Never happened. Yeah. You would never let that happen. Yeah. They're not here for you. It's, it's so many falsehoods out there. They're my told. guests. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it didn't even matter if it was one of Hef's dearest friends, celebrity, whatever, at the mansion. If you messed up and you messed with a girl, you're out. And you were on the on the do not admit list for a moment. Could be a year or two, and eventually maybe you'll come back. But no, he, he, he was not about that. He had a naughty list. He had a naughty list. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the naughty list. Kathy's like, oh, please don't put me on the naughty list. Please don't. <laughs> Thank God I never was on that one. <laughs> I should have been multiple times. <laughs> I once took a glass in the jacuzzi, and it almost happened because you cannot take glasses in the jacuzzi. And he goes, what's this glass doing in here? Do you know what that can do? And I go, I'm so naughty. <laughs> he so took put me out. on the list. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, uh, Candice, tell us uh, anything that you want to plug. Um, give us the, uh, your YouTube channel, um, anything and everything where people can find you, what you're doing, what you're up to, so we can also include that in the show. Yeah, well, um, I'm really honored because I was just uh, notified that I am um, – one of the living legends for the Dream Awards for media personality. Awesome. So, and, Good um, for you. That ceremony will be in June. And I was just, there's uh, like 10 other people that were chosen and they were all tops in their fields. And so it was really kind of made me for Clemped. I was great honor. So that's the most recent thing that's happened. Very that's cool. so exciting. And then your YouTube channel is? Candid Candace TV. Candace. And you can find me across all my social media at Candid Candace on Instagram. I have a Facebook fan page, Candid Candace. I have a Candace Jordan personal page, Twitter Candid Candace. So yeah, I'm. <laughs> and there's, it's Instagram. a lot. They, I mean, there's a lot of stuff she writes about too. Yeah, I, I, I and I love your new picture on top too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, your new headshot. Yeah. So to our audience, absolutely, um, go check out. Candice, um, her YouTube channel and, and just everything else, all the links will be on there because oh, she's a force and, and she just um, has done so many remarkable things and and well-deserved getting that re- that Thank reward, you. darling, truly. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I love you both. I we love, love you. you. So Thank much. you so much. We appreciate you. All right, love. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Echo. And I'm Kathy. And this is The The Bunny Bunny Chronicles. Chronicles. See you next time. (laughs) 